of the Phoenix Convention Center. And we're so pleased to be joined on our set now by a man who was general manager for the Atlanta Falcons for many, many years before that was with the New England Patriots. Thomas Dimitrov is here and he's got a new venture now called Sumer Sports. We're obsessed with this, well, yeah. Perloff specifically, <laughs> Thomas, because it basically assigns a number to everything on a football field and a value, and we can't wait to talk with you about this, but can we tap into your general manager side first and foremost? Of course. Okay. You're tasked with trading Aaron Rodgers. Put that, put those shoes on. What are you hoping to get in return? What's realistic that you want to get in return if you're the Packers and you're trading Rodgers? Wow, that, that I mean, for Brian Gutekinds, that's a tough spot to be in. Is it? It's kind of a great spot. Well, it's a, it's a great spot, to your point, I mean, to have a guy like that, who I think personally is one of the very best. Put aside his his antics or whatever people have their issues with, right? The guy is very, very talented, and he has, he has a leadership side, which I'm not sure who they have in there right now and, you know, how that's going to be right when, when you're when you're a GM and you're thinking about moving on from a from a guy of that stature one way or another that's a big deal you don't know how it's going to end up on the other side right so uh, you know to, to answer your question Maggie I think look it's one of those things that you have to sit down with your head coach of course your president Mark Murphy and and you as a general manager you have to really think you have to try to get as much as you can but I would tell you when when that all happened and everything was going on this year I thought Brian you are in a tough spot how do you get rid of one of the very best? Who is going to really knock on your door and pay you the money for it? Because that's that's the thing. How much longer does he have to, to, to play? So, so two first-round picks? <laughs> well, yeah. it, it's legit. It's I mean, it's a legit pick situation like that. Well, Green, isn't Green Bay structurally different? I mean, the fact that they drafted Rodgers in the first place, did that surprise you? And then Jordan Love. You know, they just don't operate at quarterback like other franchises. They, no, they don't. And I, I was going to say, like Jordan Love, when Jordan came out, there were, you know, there were questions. How was he going to, how was he going to adapt in the NFL to lead? The lead was a big thing, right? Of course, he has talent, and and that's, I mean, those are the kind of things that are tough. And quite honestly, those are tough things to measure. And so that's that's what I am fixated on right now. Where is the leadership going to come on the other side of this? That's very interesting. What, what is there an example you can give us of a time when you were? quite frankly, like mischaracterize or misjudge someone who you thought had a lot of leadership skills or qualities and they frankly just did not. Well, yeah, look, I, I probably over my 13 or 12 and a half years, there were a number of them. Luckily, I didn't feel like they were right at the top of the, the barrel, right? They were, to me, they were, you know, those those mid-rounders or beyond. I mean, that happens all the time. It's, which is one of the reasons that when we do talk about some of the Sumer stuff, Maggie, there, it's not an exact science, right? I mean, we, we can all think we'd go toe-to-toe -to -toe with any one of us as GMs for the most part I think we would talent evaluate to next to anyone in this league and it's, it's there's just there needs to be more exactness in it and it's tough when you start talking about character or dedication or what the other side is it's it is so not exact and that's a complication for us who we have an owner over our head saying hey man I'm paying you a lot of money to make really strong decisions obviously that's where I think data is out there for us to dip into what is that what makes Jalen Hurts sort of different than what people expected the second round pick seems like he kind of has a locker room with him i don't know would that be a guy that was tough to measure that's a guy that's tough to measure sure and he does have the locker room with him and i think everyone would go toe to toe in the sense of you know they would fight anyone for him i think as i've been hearing from the people in that building right i mean what how he's done there and how he's brought that team together in a situation that had its struggles a couple years ago i mean how his approach has been let me get the right quarterback in here but how he has also done a really good job over the years not totally fixating his world on the head coach and the quarterback, right? He's he's won. He won with Doug. Here he is winning with Nick. This is a fascinating element. You you compare, not to go a different way with your show, but you can compare Philadelphia and their team building approach and what Howie does to Brett Veach and Andy Reid. Completely different, mm. right? With how the whole organization, I'm a big believer in from the top down, right? And we can talk about Kansas City. I mean, what Jeffrey Lurie is doing with, with Howie Roseman and giving him the keys to the kingdom, so to speak, I think is vital in the NFL in today's world. What's the biggest difference between how things are done in Philly and KC in your mind? Yeah, look, I personally, I think, I mean, w when you have a, a head coach like Andy Reid with, with a guy like Brett Veach who is younger, 
Andy could be really domineering, right? He, he, if he could be, he's not. And he understands what that GM is, what he is, what he's for. He's fairly young, but he's got a really good mind and he's got a really good evaluation ability about him. They work together very, very well. And it is about the head coach there. We know that. Sure. He is, he is, you know, he's world renowned and one of the best. And what I guess what I'm saying is that at, at Philly, it's, it's not as much about the head coach. It's about bigger picture organizational elements. And I will say, I mean, what Brett Veach has there at Kansas City, I say this all the time, he, he's a horse guy, right? He's got the trifecta. He's got one of the very best owners. He's got one of the very best head coaches and one of the very best quarterbacks. God, that's a, that's a great place to be. No so kidding. the Eagles may have to pay Jalen Hurts this offseason. Our boss. They have to. Yes. They're in the Super Bowl. Yes, our <laughs> boss is sitting over there as a Philly guy. He says, every five years, draft a new quarterback. He's one of those guys that I know this. I don't know if our audience is ever interested in this, but the, the rookie cost of quarterbacks seems to be an important trend to get to the Super Bowl. What's your take on just the – once you pay a quarterback, it's much more challenging. Oh, it's much more challenging. You think about the money that's available, of course. We know that. It's logical, right? Um, how many teams, these two teams, how many teams have been in the Super Bowl over the last few years that have had rookie quarterbacks? I think you go back 10 years, and there's been at least one guy on a rookie deal every year except one. Well, it's funny because, you know, when we were in the, in 16 with Matt Ryan, we had a lot of money involved there, as we did with, mm -hmm. with Julio Jones. It, it became cumbersome, right? As great as those guys were, and the only reason we ever got to where we got to was because of the money we were putting in there. Then you also have owners, right? This is a whole other spot that you guys probably don't talk about a whole bunch. When you have an owner thinking about jersey sales and ticket sales, I mean, Julio Jones, you want to talk about a guy coming out of the tunnel compared to Matt Ryan, everyone loved, of course. When Julio Jones came out of that tunnel, I mean, it was, it was outrageous. The, he had the entire South was there, right, being an Alabama guy. Mm. My point there is when we started thinking about that third contract, and I'm bringing it around to any quarterback or receiver, big money, and there's a lot of other factors than just, hey, this is a little expensive for a guy. When there's a lot going on there on the, on the, on the other side of it, per the, the ownership side, it becomes complicated to make those decisions. There's a lot on your plate, I think. And wide receivers now are getting paid like crazy, and we know because they're worth it in this day and age in the NFL. Thomas Dimitrov is the CEO of Sumer Sports. We'll get to that in a moment, but got to ask about a guy who was your head coach when you were in Atlanta, which is Dan Quinn. Another coaching cycle where he's a hot name, yet he decides to go back to Dallas. Were you surprised by that? I was surprised. I really thought, I mean, Dan, you know, he didn't get picked by George Payton last year, you know, obviously at Denver. And those two were close. They, I'm not saying it's always about friendship, but you know people, you want to bring people in. Of course, Georgia decided to go a different direction. Dan has, Dan has so much. He, I think, I'm going to tell you guys, it's not just because we work together. I think he is a really, really good football coach. Massive amounts of passion. There, I have never Ever heard players talk more about wanting to be with a head coach than than regarding Dan Quinn? It's been it's always amazing. So when Dan's in this situation, I say this all the time: head coaches now, same with Sean Payton, right? At 59 years old, as a as a 50-something head coach, and Dan's not 50 yet, they are about the ownership. Mm -hmm. the, the, yes, of course, it's about the team and they want to win. But to start, they need to know that that ownership is going to be behind them. They need to know they're going to be able to jive with them. That's a big thing. It is a, it, it's a mess. Do you think that's thing. what came into play with Dan and the new Broncos ownership? Well, I don't think the Broncos ownership as much as I may think some of the other owners out here, oh, right? I mean, if, if, if people had mentioned, hey, you know, he should go to Indy or wherever else, I mean, I don't know how Dan would have gotten along with, with Jim Ursay. And I'm not being disrespectful to Mr. Ursay. I'm just saying Dan's got to look at all of those situations. Honestly, when I look at Sean Payton, I think that's a great move for them. I think George and Sean can work very well together. I've said this publicly, and not, not I just, Sean is a really good football coach, and he's going to go there and, and make, uh, do the best he can with, with a quarterback situation that's complicated. But if there's one person in the league that can get that back on the rails, I do, however, also believe, not however, I also believe that a guy like Sean, people, they're concerned more about not more about, but they're concerned about their, you know, their their empire as well, right? Mm -hmm. To go legacy. in there with, yeah, legacy. I say empire also because there's a lot there. When you're pairing with an ownership group that's worth $80 million and are really, really sound with, you know, Condoleezza Rice, what a good spot for Sean to be in there and grow. He can teach them. They can teach him. I mean, look, that, to me, that's, that's a really good situation for Sean. Not sure if you heard yesterday, Sean Payton in his opening remarks said that he is not going to allow Russell Wilson's private 
trainers in there. What do you make of that? It reminds me a little bit of New England. Oh, I love uh, it. The end. Okay, you're for no, that. Look, I, I I say this about Sean as well. As Sean learned from Bill Parcells and and Bill Belichick, that whole group. I mean, you have to you as a head coach, I believe, especially when you have that confidence, you have to own your your organization. You have to be very direct with your your assistant coaches, people in the building and your quarterback and your star players. You can't just worry about what they're thinking. And I think Sean has a great grasp of that where he'll go in to, to, to Russell and say, all right, parking spots. And quite honestly, I'll be interested to see if, if they, they jettison the office. That's a that's a very different thing. Can I just offer the flip side with Thomas Dimitrov, who's a former general manager of the Falcons joining us here. He's now the CEO of Sumer Sports. The flip side of that, I think, would be who cares it's an office? Who cares it's a coach? You're paying, you invested so much into Russell Wilson. You have to make sure this works. If he wants his personal guy there, why is that a big deal? It is a big, big deal, Maggie. I mean, it's uh, there are nuances to it. The back to locker room elements. People really, really struggle with. Even if you're making 250 million dollars, they struggle with that, right? And if and especially if things aren't going that well, there's a. There, it's very quick within that locker room where there's eye rolling and there's people saying, "Well, wait a minute, why is he getting this?" Well, we know why it, at the outset. <laughs> He's Russell Wilson. Yeah, but it, but it is. It's a complicated situation for I think for George. He's going to have to potentially backtrack. Ultimately it's not his call right now I'm speaking of George Payton it's now Sean Payton's uh, uh, you know desire and, and what he wants to do with that yeah. but well how did it work with Tom Brady and Belichick I mean did it eventually become too much for Tom Brady to just be another player under Bill Belichick uh, you know that's interesting because I remember at least as I recall uh, Tom would always go into Bill's office, right? So there's an office they would share at the end of the day, and they would talk about different things. Never did he have a, his office. To your point, maybe, maybe. You know, I've I've always thought, interestingly enough, he was the, the guy that helped me get a Super Bowl. Obviously, when being around Tom Brady, and I joke about it, but he was also the guy to help me get fired when we lost the Super Bowl <laughs> oh, right. in, in 16. You know, right? Thomas, we weren't going to bring it you up. You can bring it up. <laughs> Are you past it? I am. Well, well, you know, finish your story. No, I'm sorry. no but so I, I laugh only because when things came around, people often ask me, would Arthur have fired you two years ago if you guys won the Super Bowl in 16. And Arthur is a like like business people today. I, I love Arthur. He and I, we're really good still. But he's a two-year, he was a two-year guy. Mm. And if we would have won in 16 and 17 and 18 won a rye, we're, we're, we're on a hot seat. I mean, literally, in this in this role, it is hot seat all the time. I, I mean, especially the big cities. You, you know, you guys know how that is. Yeah, obviously, we live in New York and worked in New York, yes. so we get it. But, um, okay, so you brought it up. Like, yeah. is it, are you, are you over it, uh, the loss in the Super Bowl? I, Do you ever get over it? I don't think you ever get over okay. it, Maggie. I think, I, I think about, I don't sit there and dwell on it. I do think sometimes, wow, you know, even with Dan now, if Dan would have won the Super Bowl, w would there have been different, you know, a different approach to all these HC jobs or would people still be wondering about it? When I look back on all that and I think, I remember literally walking down on the field with Arthur. Mm -hmm. We were, we, we would normally go down six minutes, five minutes in the game right from the entire time the 13 years I was there yeah. we went down a, a quarter and a half and we're standing there and to feel that deflate through wow. through that up to the point literally guys when that coin was flipped in overtime and I it, I remember it in my mind I'm like if that oh. if that lands the wrong way Cinematic. we're done because because Tom Brady's Tom Brady and uh, obviously the rest is is history and we, we lost that but it's it's an interesting it's, it's an right. interesting bring role. it up Oh well, Maggie's a Bills fan. I don't okay. Yeah. That. So 13 seconds. I mean, this this year, four, no Bowl lead is safe anymore in the NFL. I mean, yeah, look at the Jags Chargers game. Yeah. It, it feels teams yeah. do not know how to play with a lead necessarily. It's bizarre. We I don't know. We talk about that all the time. Yeah, they they just especially in today's game, and even more so five years later feels hard to protect the lead. Why Feel, is yeah. that? I, I don't know, and I, I'm forever perplexed that we, we, we're not protecting leads. I remember that many, many times. I would go back in and watch the video and, and after a game, and I would talk to Dan or even Smitty before that, and I would ask him, Who's responsible? Why? Why are we like? Why are we not able to pull this out? And we, we, you, you, honestly, you get into a situation where you have certain teams that it becomes kind of a habit, mm. and they believe that we just, we just can't pull it out. It's, I, I'm not to get sort of enigmatic or mystical about it, but mm. it, it was very tough for me to really pinpoint that over the years. I really believed it came down to coaches, uh, is what I believe, because the coaches had to instill that element of believing that mm. they are the finishers. Which is crazy because Kyle Shanahan, who was the offensive coordinator, is one of is held up as one of the geniuses off offensive geniuses of the league are you surprised that the Super Bowl 
failure didn't stick with him more. Yeah, you know, but but a guy like that is so competent, confident about everything, and and competent sure. as far as what he does. I look back on that, and I remember being, you know, you staying in the in the in the mode here. I remember coming in two days later. We probably had two or three coaches who raised their hand in our team team meeting room. I screwed that up. I should have told Dan, run, run, run. So a lot of people were taking, uh, not credit for it, but a lot of people ownership, were ownership of it. E even even guys like, uh, I, I mean, Raheem Morris, who I think I think Raheem should get another chance. Raheem put his hand. Raheem was the assistant head coach. Who who was to blame? Like Dan, remember, and that in the end we can finish here. Dan had really basically demoted his D coordinator, so he became the de facto D coordinator, and he was relying on his O coordinator that he believed. To your point, incredibly smart, will take care of business. So there was a little bit of miss, you know, sort of misfocus, and it, and it just it just fell the way it did. And you know, I remember I hearing from people where Bill went in at halftime. I had heard, I don't know if this is lore or not, and said. I don't know how we're going to run with this team. We were a very fast. You know, yeah. Dan, Dan brought athleticism. We were about explosiveness when we came from when he came from Seattle. Yeah, that was a heck of a staff too. Yeah. Oh, wow. Get everybody on that. It was yeah. A staff. Yeah. yeah. Listen, you know how to hire them. <laughs> Thomas, nice job. Thank now you. you're the CEO. Sumer Sports said it kind of gives like more of a mathematical, like numbers-based application to football. I mean. That's right. So we, if I if I were to put it in layman's terms, it's basically it's a it's a cutting edge edge algorithmic based tool that is um, it's a roster optimization tool at the core right so under sumer sports our product is marvel stands for maximize roster value which is See, really marvel is like what our producer yeah, likes yeah. to watch oh. well, Mar right we, we made sure that we spelled it a different way oh, because okay. it was really important <laughs> we weren't getting sued yeah. but 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 <laughs> yeah. look what i would say is again i i know that there i i say this the data that's available to the NFL teams, GMs and head coaches, is so underutilized, mm. right? And and the tracking data, there is so much there. We are an evolving league. And right now, if you can get into that mode and you can, again, augment these general managers first, and that's my, when I took this job, I thought, I've been thinking about this, not an exact science, there's gotta be a way to make this more specific and exact and mathematic. And I'm, I'm not claiming to be a, an academic, I'm not a, like a, a PhD in math, but I know we do too much of that guesswork in our in our profession still still and I would tell and I would tell any owner respectfully I'd say look I think it's the responsibility of the owner and the president and the GM to be open to take that data that's there at our disposal and utilize it we're, we're not utilizing it and I think as long as you're as long as your head coach and GM are not just you know being overwhelmed by the data if they can decide what the data is to use I think it can be I think it can be a game changer so Baseball makes so much sense for analytics. I think that was all of our entryway, money ball, because there's a hitter and a pitcher. Take, for example, let me say Brock Purdy, Iowa State quarterback. Star queens that we'd be working with that would give us elements of their IP, as well as our own IP, aging curves, you know, financial curves. There's so much involved. Drop it into this algorithm. And what I used to do, a little aside, with Arthur Blank, I'd say, Arthur, uh, I'd be so proud. I'd go in and I'd say, I have 12 scenarios in the offseason for you. Here we go, blah, blah, blah. Proud as a peacock. This, this function that we have here can, can provide you with millions and millions of roster options and of course unfathomable for the mind but when you really drill it down you say okay I only want I want Sumer's three best rosters and compare it to the Atlanta Falcons roster again this is about becoming better with your decisions and more informed okay yeah. so you know the league you know the landscape what's the one coach in the league that if you brought this to them they'd be like uh-uh. <laughs> no oh, way. yeah. Old school. No yeah, way. old school. Well, look, I, I guess I would say, you know, I would say Bill only from the standpoint of... Belichick. Yeah, I, I guess I would say, I'd say Bill Belichick just because it would have to be in the spot where we've, it's evolved so much that it was tried and true where it is, right? I mean, Bill's really open-minded and, of course, brilliant, whether you guys, you know, as a Bills fan, you probably don't like to oh, hear no, that. Oh, no, I understand yeah. how brilliant he is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but, yeah. I think, but I think making sure that he's not wasting his, in his staff's time, mm. right? Where, so we're going to, with our pilot teams, and I, uh, thanks for not asking me who they are because we can't share that right now. Oh. We have two pilot teams in the NFL right now that I think are very open-minded to util utilizing what we have and providing us 
us with information as we're getting to the spot where we're going to finalize this in Jan 24. Is it as simple as age? The younger guys are, more, uh, you know, Nick Sirianni has this reputation. He's going for it on fourth down because he's more into analytics. There's this wave of coaches. He's McVay, Shanahan, Sirianni. These young guys seem very open to thinking differently about football. Yeah, and I think that, that late 30 group and, yeah. and even to the mid-40 group, I think, I think as you get a little bit older, I think they're open to it. Like, I was talking to Dan Quinn about it. Yeah. I think Dan is open to it. I think there's some really good coaches out there. I think it probably is a little more chronological. But if we can prove, mm -hmm. and this is what I've said to Paul Tudor Jones, our, our founder, I said, we have to be a part of the evolution for, for the GMs and the head coaches to accept it. We can't ramrod. We have Ooh. to say, look, let's work together for two or three years. You can trust us. The NFL, if they're not trusting, they'll never take it on. Got it. They have to trust. Thomas Dimitrov, last one for you, and this is our little uh, nod to Aaron Rodgers, his, like, passion for astrology. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your sign? I'm cancer, actually. Okay, so would you like us to read your horoscope yes, please, for today? Yes, please. The coming days promise a busy social time. You might host a party at your home. Oh. You may feel terribly rushed and wonder if it will be able to get if you'll be able to get everything done. Don't worry, it will all come out right. Oh, is that you. ring true to you at it all? It rings true. You throw in a Super Bowl party? No, I am. I'm heading home on Thursday, and I'm going to get ready to do it. So there thank you. There you go. Everything's wow. going to go great. You guys are great. How thank about you. That? Thomas thank Dimitrov, you. CEO now of Sumer Sports. Thank you so much. We appreciate thank it. Thank you for having me. All right, we've got. A lot more fun to be had. They liked you in the chat, by the way, Thomas. Big fans. <laughs> They're fans of you in our YouTube chat, so you got some more fans out there. Uh, coming up next, we are ranking every player in the Super Bowl. Well, actually, Pete Prisco did it. So we're going to talk to Pete. <laughs> who is the most important person in this game might not be who you think. We'll get